All right, so, um, other questions? My plan is just to go through the uh, study guide that I posted, but it's not particularly exciting. So questions are more exciting. Go for the not exciting route. Okay. Um, Can we get an example of what kind of coding we'll do? Is it going to be similar to the midterm? Yeah, similar in spirit to the midterm. Okay. In spirit. In spirit. Um, so, so, you know, I'm not going to say write an index program like PA4 would make it even better. Um, <laughs> but, you know, write a function to do this or, or write a program that reads some command line arguments and does something with them or write a bash script to take input and, and you know, add up numbers and respond in a certain way, things like that. So it's five programming questions that's worth 50 points total and then it's I think 25 multiple choice short answer fill in the blank worth two points each. Actually I don't think there's any multiple choice. I think they're all fill in the blank. Yeah. Can you make at least two of those multiple choice? At least two multiple choice? Yeah. Um, no, because it's already been printed. Dang. <laughs> but I guess I could give you some options. Is there a <laughs> minimum on the final that we have to get to pass the class? Uh, no, if you get a zero on the final, but numerically your grade is high enough to pass, you'll pass. Perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> How much is the final weight? <laughs> That's the I don't know. I don't know what my percentages are because I changed them this quarter. Yeah. I know some classes, you have to get like a 50% or something on the Yeah, final. yeah. Um, on the other hand, if you were to get 100 on the final and numerically your grade was low enough to fail the course, you probably would not fail the course. Right, I, I do have the option of saying you got off to a slow start and you thought the quarter started in October and so you missed the first three weeks of assignments and so on, but you know, you've done everything great and, and got a good score on the final exam, right? Is that Chase? So, you what? described Chase's example? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, okay. <laughs> no, I might be thinking about my own past though. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was not always the best student. I was I was hanging out with Chasey like like three weeks into the court. He's like, I'm gonna switch to CS, and I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was like talking about how he didn't know what was going on at all. Mm -hmm. He was do yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, that's all he told me. Yeah, he was he was doing our assignments on the side. He was like looking over someone's yeah, yeah, and he would do it on his own. Mm -hmm. It was ridiculous. It's good stuff. All right. Um, so yeah. So so possible topics. Yes. Okay. So if we're gonna go into the study guide, yeah. I have some two questions on the midterm that I'm awesome. um, Okay. So it's uh, the short answer part. Um, so show your current working directory and uh, rename the main.c to program.c. How would I how would I go about doing that? So show your current working directory is just pwd. Okay, that stands for printer working directory. Say what? Followed by the directory name or just PWD? Um, PWD shows you the directory that you're in right now. Okay. So print name of current working directory. Alright. And then what was the other one? It was uh, rename main.c to program.c. Um, so there's main.c, so mv is a command for renaming. So mv main.c current.c. Right. I mean, if you look at inode numbers like we were talking about yesterday, the inode number will be exactly the same before and after that. That's the difference with, with move versus uh, copy and delete. Right. If you copy, you get a new inode number. All right, so Linux, know your basic Linux commands, um, which most likely you've been using throughout the quarter, right? so you don't need to study these separately, probably. Um, so 
ODE. Echo we use a lot in scripting for output. What's OD? OD you don't have to know, but but it's a good one to know. I won't ask you on the test. But OD is is your octal dump utility. Um, so if I say OD go, it prints out the contents of the file go in octal. And it's really nice because if you have an executable file, um, Right, so I have this file called burn, it's an executable program. If I try to look at it, it's, it's you know, funny symbols and lots of, of blue characters. Um, if I say OD burn, I get nice clean hex code that may not be terribly easy to read, but it doesn't blow up my screen, all right? And if I say OD-C burn, I also get, um, you know, printable characters when they're printable show up in an <coughs> easy to read format. Um, and XXD is even better because I get my output in hex and I get printable characters on the right. So OD is just a way to look at a file in a more controlled way, a binary file usually. And if you've got things like backslash R's in a file or something like that, it's hard to tell just by catting the file. It's easy to tell by using OD or, or something like that. So I'm recognizing the look of that. Is that what a uh, hex editor prints out? Yeah, largely. Um, there's hex editors that look exactly like this, and you see this on like, you know, Tom Clancy type movies on Netflix. Um, when they want to show somebody hacking something, they always throw up a hex dump like that. <laughs> but yeah, there's hex editors that do that. Um, I forget what my hex editor is called. G-hex. So G-hex opens up a, a window that I can use to actually edit my my binary code. Um, and this, you know, is stuff you do pretty carefully because if you just change binary code at random, you're probably going to break it. Would we break it if we just started doing that on your computer? On my computer? Yeah. Something would break. Let's just do it. <laughs> Change it from elf to elf. All right, so burn no longer works. Because it needs to be ELF for it to decide that it's an executable program. But I can go ahead and make that an elf and I don't know. This is scary. I take it back, dude. This is super scary. <laughs> this could be like, you know, the thing that solves the halting problem, though. <laughs> I feel like I'm in top class. And then it's like fame and fortune. <laughs> so we'll just save that and quit. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Can we undo that? Yeah, if you remember everything that I changed. No, man. <laughs> Um, yeah, hex editing is fun. It's it's because if if you actually look at the assembly language or the machine language, you can turn it into assembly language, and you can say, you know, here's where I'm doing an increment instruction. You can change that to a decrement instruction and, oh, and do cool. stuff. Right. So so when we used to hack the school's computer when I was an undergrad, I had a friend who really wanted to see what would happen if you changed the clock to go backwards. And so <laughs> in the operating system, he found the instruction that was an increment. That happened every, you know, 10,000 microseconds. The thing that counted 10 millisecond increments would bump up this register, and it would get stored somewhere. And so he just changed the increment to a decrement. And I wrong. That was me who did that. <laughs> um, and it, it worked well for about 20 seconds. Um, I went into VI and I started editing a file and. I type a parentheses, and when you type a parentheses, it shows you the matching parentheses for like two seconds and then goes back to the first one. Well, it showed me the matching parentheses, but it never went back to the first one. It was waiting for two seconds to pass, but time was running backwards. 
So it would have had to wait four billion minus two seconds to roll over. Oh no. And things like that started happening and after about, you know, twenty seconds we were all seeing weird things and then the system just crashed gloriously. <laughs> so but you can do stuff like that with, with uh if you go down to the binary level. It's uh when do we get to learn that? <laughs> anytime you want. Just now? We yeah, just, just now. The cool thing is, you know, we had to get permission to hack our, our school's computer because the whole engineering department was using this computer, right? Um, but you've got a laptop, you can do what you want with it. You, you are, you know, root, if you have a Linux system running on your laptop, you've got root access um, and you can do all this stuff. And it's, it's a really, really good way to learn you know, programming, assembly language, tool usage, operating system theory, all this kind of stuff. Best way to learn it is by getting in there and like tinkering with it. You know, you take a car apart to learn how engines work. That's um, not true. But you don't you don't hurt yourself the way you do if you like decide to learn how brakes work <laughs> by taking apart your brake system. You know, um, and you can mess up your laptop and you just rebuild it. <laughs> <laughs> Right, or get a Raspberry Pi if you really want to be insulated because you just make a new flash drive and you're back to square one. Windows is not that easy. Windows is not that easy, right? Windows is not meant for that kind of thing. It's meant for, <laughs> for you know, like business use and such. Um, just install Linux on the computers at school. Say what? Just install Linux on one. Yeah, I'll sneak in some app. night and just like overwrite all of them. I feel like one day just, you're going to Just minimize the drive. And then just install that. Install yeah, that yeah. Picture. You're gonna have like a mini army of students who just all do your bidding. Yeah, yeah. And you, you <laughs> hey, good SLP. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can always boot Linux from a flash drive, right? But that's gotten harder to do under Windows. Um, I've done that. Because they have I've secure boot installed usually. Um, but you know, to some degree, you can put Linux on a flash drive, pop it into one of the collaboratoriums, and just boot from there, and have Linux access. Which is why things like, you know, encrypted, having a password for your Windows boot up screen or something is usually ridiculous. Um, unless you're encrypting the hard drive itself, it's just kind of, you know, it's putting a big lock on a gate, but there's no fence outside the gate. <laughs> you know. um. All right, so basic Unix commands, um, you know, word count to count lines and words and letters in standard in, rm to remove a file, move to rename or move, cp to copy, and so on and so forth. Um, standard in, out, and error. So these are our, our three standard I.O. streams that we have. And usually, we can think of standard in as meaning the keyboard. Okay, and we can think of standard out as meaning the display, and standard error is also a display. Um, but that's, that's kind of a working notion. That's not exactly what's going on. Standard in is the thing that a program is typically ingesting from. And usually it's the keyboard. If you say get car, it's waiting for you to type something on the keyboard. But we have other ways to um, set up standard in. For example, if you have a program main, and you say main less than the name of some file, now if you try to read from standard in with get car or f gets or something, instead of waiting for you to type on the keyboard, it will open up this file and it'll read from that file. So it'll read a character or a line or whatever you're trying to ingest. And each time you try to read from standard in, it will read from the next spot in the file. And when there's nothing left in the file and you try to read from standard in, it will act as if you had hit control D on the keyboard. And it'll say you've hit end of file. And standard out, normally if you say printf or echo, it appears on your screen, but same way you can redirect standard out with a greater than, and anything that would come on your screen instead goes into this file. And if you redirect into a file, the file gets cleared out before it starts writing into it. If you use two greater than signs, it appends to the file, so it just starts from the bottom. Um, so that's one way to, to redefine standard in, standard out. And with PA5, right, we talked about this two greater than, which says take standard error and redirect it to a file. Um, but we also have pipes. So we can have program A, and we can pipe that into program B. 
and now standard out from program A is connected to standard in for program B. So picture, you know, a little pipeline between these. Output from program A becomes the input for program B. And if we do another pipe, the output from program B will be the input for program C and so on. And so we can do things like, you know, ls shows us a list of files, ls pipe into word count, takes that output from the ls command and counts how many lines of output there are. So it tells us there's 56 lines of output. And I can pipe that into awk print dollar sign one, and that gives me a 56. All right, because it took that output 56 space 58 space 544, and it fed that to this awk command, and this awk command says print the first field of your input, which was just a 56. So we use pipes to string commands together. We learn a few commands, 15, 20 commands, and then we put them together in ways that, that let us do more powerful things. And that's, that's mucking around with standard in, standard out, basically. So arrows move stuff in and out of files, and the pipe just moves stuff and send it out to Exactly, yeah. That would be a stupid question. Um, I'm just thinking about pipes. Mm -hmm. Can you have, uh, like, so you have three programs, and the third program needs, or the first program needs something from the third program? Mm. Can you have, like, the same instance of a program piped into? No, that's a little harder. Um. Like, like, suppose I wanted program A and program B to both supply input to program C. I don't know if there's a way to do that. I mean, like, uh, program C back into program A. Hmm, I see. Um, not that I know of. Because, I mean, I could put program A out here, but it's going to be a separate instance, yeah. right? Um, yeah, that, that may be not doable. There's probably some way to do it, but I definitely don't know how. Maybe like creating a file. And then you could create a file. I mean, if, if depending on why you were doing that, right, if, if you needed this to be continually generating input to here while it was continually generating input to there, that's harder. If, if it's, um, you know, just something where you want to do this and then you want to take that output and put it into program A, right, mm -hmm. then you can use a file or probably even just use another program A out here. Like I can put sort, you know, five times in a string of pipes, and that'll work perfectly. Or said, right? We've done said a bunch of times. All right, quotation marks. So, um, double quotes and single quotes um, are useful in Bash for for couple of things. One, if you want to embed spaces in something, right? So I can just say x equals hello and I can echo dollar sign x and it's hello. If I try to say x equals this is a test, I'm going to get a problem. Because it thinks I said x equals this and then I said is a test and it thinks I'm asking to execute a command called is, right? So if I really wanted all of that to be the value of x, I can throw this inside quotes. And then if I look at x, you'll get it. I'll get it. There we go. <laughs> Yay, four tries. Then if I look at x, it's it's that string that I assigned way at the top of the page. Um, and if you use single quotes, it pretty much works the same. Okay. The difference with single quotes is. I can put dollar signs in here, and the, they're just treated as dollar signs. Whereas if I say x equals double quote, this is a dollar sign test. It says this is a test at linux.engrcs.com. Nice. <laughs> right, because test is a symbol that's set up to mean test at linux.engrcs.com. So if you want to suppress that automatic evaluation of variables, you can use single quotes. 
if you don't have anything weird going on, x equals 12.4, I don't need quotes at all. But quotes rarely hurt, and they can be helpful sometimes. Right, so I can set x equal to hello, and I can say if hello equals dollar sign x, then echo yes, and it echoed yes. And if I set x equal to ha ha, and I repeat that if statement, it does not echo yes. I was hoping that would give me an error, but it didn't. Um, could use double quotes anyway. <laughs> I don't have a good example, but this is this is safest. double quotes doesn't hurt. Sometimes on, on older versions of the shell, right, if, if x is, is missing, um, this will actually generate an error because what you're actually saying is if hello equals equals nothing, and you get these weird error messages. Whereas if, if I put this inside quotes, right, then I'm okay. But anyway, double quotes, single quotes, right, they don't do any harm. Double quotes don't do any harm. Single quotes suppress evaluation of, of variables and stuff. Um, but double quotes let you say this is a string, and even if it's empty, it's still just treated as a sink. But back quotes are totally different. Okay, back quotes um, are a different kind of beast. If I try to echo back quote hello, I get an error. So back quote something means execute something as a command and then use the value produced on standard out as the value of this back quote expression. So if I echo back quote date, right, it executes the date command, standard out was equal to this string, and so it pretends I said echo this string. And if I say vi back quote date, then it's going to try to edit something called thu because that was what I said. I said VI, Thursday, 5 December, etc. And if I go to the next file, I'm editing DEC, and the next file, I'm editing 5, and the next file, I'm editing that, right? And I got two more files to edit. All right, so here's an empty directory. If I say touch, uh, back quote date. I just created a bunch of files, All right? Because what happens? Well, this is what date said. So I said touch Thursday deck five eleven thirty PST twenty nineteen, and touch file name says create a file name. If I try to rm date, it tells me there's no such file as 11.30.22, but it removed 2019 and 5 and DEC and PST and Thursday. All right, so back quotes are special. The way that we can execute a command and grab hold of the output produced by that command. And it's one way we can basically use scripts as functions. And if we want to return a value from a function, we can output it with an echo statement, and we can capture it by using back quotes. Did you put back quotes in something that's been single quoted? Will it print the back quotes or print the output? I think single quotes will suppress um, the back quote function, so this should just print out back quote date. Okay. Single quotes really kind of put the kibosh on everything, whereas double quotes will, will still execute the date command.
All right, so what is a shell? A shell is a program that typically we use to access resources in a computer, in this case, mostly to run programs. So Bash is the shell we've been working with in this course. Um, and it's, it's a program that's running right now, right? And it's, it's printed out a prompt in brackets, and it's showing me a blinking cursor, and it's waiting for me to type. Um, and when I type something like GCC, it will try to run a program named GCC. So we mostly use, use the shell to execute programs. And when we're listing files or deleting files or creating files, we're still just running programs. Right? When I remove a file, I'm running a program called RM, whose job is to find the things that I listed on the command line, the command line arguments, and remove them. Um, Bash RC is um, an initialization file. So in my home directory, there's a file called bash RC, dot bash RC. And basically, anytime I run bash, bash will look for this file, and if it finds it, it will go ahead and pretend that I typed in all of this stuff. Okay, before it comes to the, the first prompt. So this lets me do things like set up aliases. So when I want to mute my, my sound system, I can just type V0, right? And that's an alias to this A mixer command, which sets the master volume to zero. And at the command prompt, I can say alias V0 equals blah, 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 but I don't want to type that every time that I come into bash. So because it's sitting in my dot bash RC, this gets executed every time that I start a bash session. So every time I, I do my control alt T to bring up a terminal, all of this stuff has happened. Okay. So dot bash rc is a file. Dot bash rc is a file. Just so a plain old file. I think they tried to do this. Mm -hmm. they created an alias. Okay. So we'll log into the server. Okay. And it doesn't like it. Let's look at it. Okay. So you can pull whatever you want in here, right? So so I have a remapping of key code 66. That's my caps lock. This turns my caps lock into just a left shift. So if I accidentally hit caps lock, it just looks like a shift button instead of a caps lock. And school tools for, for doing things with, with um, you know, stuff I prepare for lecture and so on and so forth. Um, and my shortcuts for CSE 223 and so on and so forth. Um, so that's your bash RC. And, and a lot of programs have these RC files associated with them. So um, I have a file called .exrc. That's an initialization file for VI. And whatever I put in here, when I say VI something, it reads this file and pretends I've typed these things in. So when I VI bash RC, it thought that I typed syntax off, which is why there's no color coding on here. Um, If I change this to syntax on, and then I go into bash RC, I've got my color coding for syntax highlighting. So, how do you get color coding to turn off on terminal? So, set ignore case and search for color, and everywhere that you find color, I just commented it out. Because normally you don't get color on, on your, your bash session, oh, okay. um, but it gets turned on by the default bash RC. So I basically go through here, and anytime it mentions color, I just comment out those lines, force color prompt, and so on and so forth. And that's why I get like a two color display. Pretty. Yeah. So, so these RC files are for customizing, basically. And by convention, they're usually something RC, uh, where the something is the name of the program. VI is a visual version of EX, so that's why it's EXRC. Um, all right, you know about the shebangs, number sign, exclamation mark, first line of the script, tells the system which program to use to execute the script. So if I'm sitting in bash and I don't have that first line, it'll execute the script as a bash script, because I'm sitting in a bash shell. If I'm sitting in a C shell, 
it'll execute the script with C shell. Mm -hmm. So if you want to force it to execute with a certain command, you say number sign exclamation mark and then the full path to that command, slash bin slash bash or whatever, and it executes from there. Um, aliases, you just mentioned aliases. So aliases let us, let us specify one command to take the place of another. So if I don't like the ls command, if I'm, I'm used to saying dir, right, uh, it's already set up. If I'm used to saying blah to list my files, right, I can say alias blah equals ls dash l, or ls dash l. And now when I say blah, it does the same thing as ls dash l. How do you undo all the changes that you do daily? What kind of changes? Just like stuff like this. Oh, so so aliases, for example, have no effect once you've logged out. They go away. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but if, if I'm making tons of files and stuff, um, I can do an LSLRT. It lists things in reverse order, and I know that I monkeyed with the burn file and the go file and made a directory ha and a directory files, and once in a while I clean it up. I see. If I'm really with it, I just do everything in a subdirectory and then I get rid of the directory. Nice. But I usually am not that with it. All right, so aliases, you can set up aliases for, for pretty much anything. If you don't like, um, you know, doing git push origin master, I can alias go equals git push origin master. And then when I say go, it'll go ahead and it'll do that git command. And if I put that line that says alias go equals in my bash RC, it's always there. Anytime I log in, I can just say go, and it pushes over to the remote repository. So different ways you can customize your environment. Uh, processes, I'm not going to go heavy on processes on you, OK? But the basic things you should know, using an ampersand to run a command in the background. OK, this is really useful. Um, if I say command name with an ampersand after it, it runs that command, but I'm back at my prompt and I can type and I can do things, right? But if I say jobs, I can see I've got this command and it's, it's running behind the scenes. And I can have another command and I can have another mand. And now I've got three things running in the background and I'm using sleep so that they don't finish too quickly. Um, and if I want to bring one of those to the foreground so that it's not just running behind the scenes, like I want sleep 400 to come into the foreground, I can say foreground percent two because it's got a two in there. And now it's as if I just typed in sleep 400. And if I control C, that ends that program. Control Z would send it back. And control Z will send something into the background. So if I say sleep 1,000, and I'm sitting here and I've got to wait 20 minutes. If I hit Control Z, that stops it. So now when I look at my jobs, I've got my two sleep commands running in the background. I've got the sleep 1000, which has stopped. If I want that to continue running behind the scenes, I can say background job four. I can bring it to the front by saying foreground percent four. And I could stop it again and put it in the background and so on. And if I want to kill these, right, I could bring job one to the foreground and control C it. Or I can just say kill and the job number. So that killed job four. And if I want to kill job three, I can kill percent three. And that kills that. And there's no jobs. I won't ask you to do anything with fork, but fork's the way that we create new processes in C. You call fork, and when it returns, you'll have a parallel process running. Same values of variables, same place in the code, but the return value from fork is different between the original and the child. So the child has a return value of zero, the parent has a return value which is non-zero, and which is the process ID of the child. I won't ask you more general concepts about processes. Um, I will ask you concepts about file systems. Um, 
So, um, so files are organized as a hierarchy, right? Um, so PWD shows you what your directory is. So right now I'm in home, Nick, files 224, fall 2019. All right, so I'm, I'm down several steps from the top level directory, which is slash. If I do an ls on slash, it's got a handful of files in there, including a file called home. And if I do an ls on slash home, it's got three files, including one called nick. And if I look in the nick subdirectory, that's got other directories underneath. And I can look at files, and I can look at 224, and I look at 224, fall 2019. And that's the contents of that directory. Well, that's also what my current directory is. So if I just say ls, it shows me the same contents. What is cheat? What is cheat? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Occasionally, I find interesting things when I'm grading, and they go under there for further analysis. Open it? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, I can show you exams. There you go. Can you open up? Can you open any of them? Yeah, give us a I can open the midterm. Is that close? No. I don't know. Yeah. What about final point? In spirit. Does that one sound good? Yeah. Yeah, I'll show it to you next week. <laughs> In fact, I'll give you each a hard copy of it next week. How about that? Cool. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. So, okay. So, so hidden files um, are just files that begin with a period, right? So that you don't have to constantly deal with the fact that that there's a. Um, there's these files that, that we might not want to see every day. You have to be careful here. Yeah, I'm usually pretty careful, but not always. Um, well, that's a really boring directory. Um, so, so in my home directory, I have all these files with dots in the beginning. Right, which I don't really care about on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't really care about my bash RC file because I, I put something in there and I just want to forget it about it. I don't care about my dot xilinx file because that's for doing FPGA development or dot wine, which is my Windows emulator and so on and so forth. Most of these files in here are, are files that need to exist, but I don't really need to look at it. I don't need to look at git config. Right, it has to be there for me to do Git. It's got my username and things like that, um, but but I don't want to see those. So normally when I say ls, it skips all of those things. So these files that start with a period, we call them hidden files, and it's just that ls doesn't show them to you by default. You can say ls a and it will. Um, all right, permission bits. Um, so there's there's a file called go. Which um, which just says hello. You Which just says hello. Thank you. Um, and it has these. When you do an ls l, your first ten uh, characters of output tell you information about the file. The first character is usually a dash. It's a d if this is a directory. It's an l if it's a link. But the next nine characters are permission bits. Okay, so permission-wise, um, Unix sees the world um, as three camps. There's the person who owns the file. There's people who don't own the file but are in the same group as the person who owns the file. And then there's the rest of the world. So if I look at myself, I'm username is Nick, I'm in my own group called Nick. If I do this on the Linux server, my username is Nick, my group is faculty. If you do this, your username is whatever your login name is and your group is students. Okay, so we can set permissions 
for the person who owns the file, for other people in the same group, for you that's other students, for me it's people like Izad, and then for anybody who doesn't fit into those two categories, the rest of the world. And for each of these we can say, are you allowed to read, write, or execute the file? And it's a 9-bit binary mask. So when we set something to be 755, we're writing this 9-bit number in octal. Okay, 755. And basically if there's a 1, then that entity has that permission. So when I set a file to 755, it means the owner can read, write, and execute the file. Other people in the group can read and execute, but not write. And the rest of the world can read and execute, but not write. So does that command not require, does that command require octal then? Um, there's other ways to do it, but the cool way is to use octal. Okay. <laughs> right, so I could say change mod 755, and then a file name. But you can do things like change mod O plus R, and it'll add read permission to the owner. But I don't think it does binary. I think it's it's one of these things that just insists on octal, um, or maybe there's a switch that'll let you do it. So if I change my mode to 742 on this file, go. Well, the 7, that's a 111, means the owner has rewrite execute permission. The 4 is binary 100, so the group got read, no write, no execute. And the 2 is 010, that's no read, write, no execute. So this is a weird permission scheme, right? People in my group can read the file but not write it. The rest of the world can write it but not read it. And so I can do anything I want. So it's like VI, uh, does it require that you can read and write it? Yeah, so, so, um, so here I've got read access to the file but not write access. So if I VI go, I can look at it, but it's telling me it's read only. And if I try to write it, it'll say read only option is set. And if I try to put something into it, it says permission denied. So here I've given read write access to everybody except myself. So somebody else who's in my group or somebody who's not in my group could read, write, and execute this file, but I can't even cat it. If I try to VI it, it won't show me the contents and so on. And I can't remove it because that's the extreme version of writing a file. But it knows that I own it. So it'll say, yeah, it's right protected. Do you want to remove it anyway? And I can say yes. And it'll go ahead and save me the trouble of changing the permission back to writable and then deleting it. So that's, that's the load on permission bits. Um, variables, we talked about these things with respect to quotes. Let me just talk about evaluations in the last 10 seconds. Um, x equals 2 plus 3. x is equal to 2 plus 3. If you want to evaluate an expression, throw it inside dollar sign paren paren. And then it'll actually be equal to the result of that arithmetic expression. All right, so we'll, we'll go through uh, built-in variables, Zenity, you know, GCC, you know, GDB. We'll start in seriousness with make files, regexes and such, and then the programming parts are not a whole lot to say because you've been doing these things all quarter, so we'll run through those pretty quickly tomorrow. Is there, and no, should... uh, Is there what? No uh, VI stuff? Um, I will not ask you to do VI commands. Yeah. All right, I'll see you tomorrow.